So to start, I want to um, uh, probably start broad with creation and then work and narrow down towards why the household is important and why it's been displaced in our culture today and why we need to recover it. And so to start at the beginning, you know, we all know the, the Genesis account, right? When uh, the Lord, the eternal word, uh, created the heavens and the earth and it culminates in uh, man and woman, right? Endowed with his image. Um, and that's, that's creation. And in Narnia, it takes on a very similar form, but uh, still a, a, little, a little bit different. Um, Narnia is birthed by the great lion Aslan, but it's through song. And it's this beautiful picture of, uh, of the lion singing and then things coming into uh, existence. That's really cool. And the magician's nephew. And what I want to um, bring up here and bring into focus is what happens after the first stage of the song is completed. So I want to read this to you from the magician's nephew. Then two wonders happened at the same moment. One was that the voice was suddenly joined by other voices, more voices than you could possibly count. They were in harmony with it, but far higher up the scale, cold, tingling, silvery voices. The second wonder was at the blackness overhead all at once was blazing with stars. So first off, uh, there's this clear reference, allusion to Psalm 19, you know, uh, the heavens proclaim the glory of God and the sky proclaims his, his handiwork. Um, but the stars aren't just displaying here in Narnia, they aren't just displaying uh, their creator's glory. They're also responding to, uh, to being created. They are singing back. They are singing in harmony with uh, with their creator. That's really where the title of my talk comes from, is the household's melody, is that creation itself has a voice. We can either choose to sing in harmony with the great song, with the rest of the choir, or we can diverge from the beaten path and sing a song that is disharmonious with the lion. And if we were to fast forward a little bit in the Narnian calendar, we do see that disharmony has ensnared Narnia in the shape of winter with the White Witch. And this is where um, it picks up in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. When Lucy first enters into Narnia, we see that there's, um, there's winter in Narnia. And if you've watched the film, which I think uh, the film for The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe is the best out of the film adaptations. They kind of get worse and worse after that one. But um, after, or when, Narnia, or when Lucy enters into Narnia, it's this really charming atmosphere, right? She's looking up, seeing the snowflakes fall. She sees the lamppost. And it's just a, a really enchanting picture. But this winter is an enchanted winter. And it's not actually winter. It's a, it's a cursed winter. Um, it's a winter that takes creation out of its rhythm. Because you know, to, to quote Mr. Tumnus, he says, it's, it's always winter, but never, anyone remember? Christmas. Never Christmas, right? Always winter, but never Christmas. Also, it's, uh, it's an endless winter. It's just going and going. We don't know how long it's been going in Narnia, but it's been going for some time. And there's no expectation of another season to come. No expectation of spring, right? Like right now, we're like on the precipice of spring. And we're, I, I, I'm personally excited to get outside again, play at the park with my kids and, and all that stuff that, that we look forward to for, for spring. But this is just not the case in Narnia. Narnia is just, it's this constant winter. It's essentially a slow death for all things, right? It's creation being taken out of its rhythm. It's the natural being turned unnatural. And I think this image of an endless winter really resonates with us because we, we see it all over in our world today, right? Uh, we see winter's effects. We see corruption and injustice amongst our elected leaders who promise us the opposite. We see senseless killing and violence in the name of peace. We see men dressing like women. We see uh, uh, women dressing like men and acting like men. We see beautiful stone temples built all across our valley, right? But they are built to the glory of man, not to the glory of God. We see mothers and fathers willing to discard their children by aborting them in the womb. Like these, we see these things in our world. I, I keep listing examples, but we know deep down this is just not right. This is the natural being turned unnatural. This is the effects of winter. We find ourselves in what Lewis would call enemy-occupied territory. He uses that in a few places in his writing. 
And I think that really sums up uh, the, the, the witch's winter as well, as enemy-occupied territory. And of course, you know, we live in Utah. This is, I believe, the one state that has never had a Christian majority. Isn't that right, Eric Bill? Yeah? Yeah, it's the, it's the one state that has never seen that. And so we probably feel this acutely, um, winter's effects and being in hostile land. And I want to share with you the full quote um, from his book, Mere Christianity, about enemy-occupied territory. Uh, Enemy-occupied territory. That is what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed. You might say land in the skies and is calling us to take part in the great campaign of sabotage. I love that subversive language where uh, we are in enemy-occupied land and it's our job to sabotage this, this territory. And so the question for us is, you know, how do we sabotage the plans of the enemy in the name of the rightful king? And, you know, come back to those examples, we see that in our world and we tend to go um, in our social media driven age to this kind of approach. This, any fans of Lord of the Rings in here? Okay, just a heads up, I'm kind of a nerd so you're going to see some, some of this as we go along. But this is at the end of the Return of the King and it's this very epic moment where Aragorn, son of Arathorn, who's the heir to the throne of Gondor, he turns to his, his army and he's like, for Frodo, and he charges off into this host of orcs to buy time for Frodo to then go into uh, Mount Doom and destroy the ring. Uh, really epic uh, moment. And, you know, I think in our day and age, uh, we, we, we think doing the Christian life looks a bit like this, where it's, it's highly visible. It's in front of everyone. It's getting all the views and the clicks. It's, um, it's, you know, it, even to put in some examples from the Bible. It's David versus Goliath. It's Elijah on Mount Carmel. It's, Dan, it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. It's those these big moments, and we think that the Christian life looks like that totally. And if we're not doing something like that, then maybe we're falling short. And I would never say that those moments aren't important right? The Lord does use those moments for big things. But I do think we've probably overemphasized those big moments and underemphasize the smaller mustard seed like um, things that we're, we are to do as, as Christians. You know, um, so we think the Christian life looks a lot like this when it actually looks a little bit more like this. And this is a picture of the beavers out, uh, at dinner with the Pevensey children. This is right after Mr. Beaver went out into the wood, woods, risked his neck um, to find the Pevensey children after Mr. Tumnus was arrested to bring them back into his home. And now they're enjoying a meal of boiled potatoes, of uh, freshly caught fish. Uh, oh, I, 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 maybe I shouldn't list it because I'm going to just get, get very... Uh, very hungry, um, but uh, <laughs> actually I'm good. My wife made this coffee cake uh, that I enjoyed this morning. That was, that was great. But anyways, um, they're enjoying dinner here at this home, and I kind of want to use this as a launching off point to then talk about the beavers and what part they played in the story and how they uh, were important in the coming of spring. Um, so with this photo, we see multiple things here. Uh, we see first hospitality. We see that the beavers welcome them into their home um, and they're, they're giving them a meal. We uh, also see that there is uh, Mr. Beaver. It, he's playing a prophetic role where he will later on tell them about Aslan and, and a few other things which I'll, which I'll cover in, in a bit. But before we really get to some of these practical examples, I also want you to notice where they are, the setting here. They are in this little home on this dam. It's nice and warm. They're enjoying food. They're, um, they're feasting and, and reveling um, in, in each other's company. But what's outside of them? It's the witch's winter, right? It's this winter that's waging war on them. But still, they're in this nice little home, feasting, enjoying each other, to the glory of God. 
I think it's just a, a really good picture for us um, in, in our day and age as we find ourselves in enemy occupied territory. You know, one, one of the more powerful things we can do is being in our homes and doing things like this, doing the Christian life together. And there are multiple things that I uh, talk about with the beavers and what part they play in the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I want to focus on, on three things, and two of them are in regards to uh, the image bearers here, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, because I think um, a big part of uh, how we can sabotage the, winter's win the witch's winter uh, has to do with um, being image bearers of God, imaging our Lord and Savior um, as he has called us to. And so I want to start with Mr. Beaver first. And when I say here in the slide, men combat winter by being prophets, priests, and kings in their households. Uh, Mr. Beaver exemplifies a godly man. Even though he is a beaver, he exemplifies a godly man. I, I would argue that the beavers um, are more human than they are animal in terms of how they act. They are really... Um, they, they stand out even amongst all the other animals in Narnia, if you were to, to count them up. More the, uh, a lot of the animals act pretty animalistic, while, these, uh, while the beavers, they have a home, they have a hearth, they have, they're able to cook, right? Um, they're a little bit more human. They're more out of, uh, has anyone ever read The Wind in the Willows? By Kenneth Grom. Fantastic story. Um, it's very clear that Lewis pulled from The Wind in the Willows when he's describing the beavers. In fact, the only um, Narnian creature that comes close to uh, being uh, human like, like the beavers is Reepicheep the mouse from uh, Prince Caspian in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. But um, yeah, so and anyways, Mr. Beaver, he exemplifies a godly man and men co combat winter by being prophets, priests, and kings in their households. And uh, you've probably seen these uh, terms before, these offices before, because this is ultimately fulfilled by, by Christ, right? And we see that, especially in the opening verses of Hebrews. In just the first three verses, it talks about how Christ fulfills the role of prophet, priest, and king. So I'm not saying that Mr. Beaver has like some sort of messianic, or uh, he has some sort of messianic significance. But I do think as an image bearer, um, he, um, or men can image Christ um, by uh, being prophets, priests, and kings in their households. And so I'm going to go through each office in turn, talk about how Mr. Beaver does that. So first off with prophet. You know, a prophet um, th does many things. A prophet tells the truth in order to uh, arouse right action and thinking and the right heart from, from the audience. And what, and what comes with that is uh, warnings too. So if you look through the Old Testament, you're going to see all sort of prophetic warnings, right? And Mr. Beaver does also give prophetic, a prophetic warning to the children. This takes place right after uh, their meal and they realize that Edmund is missing. And we all know that Edmund, he was sneaking off to go to the White Witch because he wanted more of that Turkish delight, right? He wanted his sweets. Um, but they're, they're, they're searching for him, they're out in the cold, they're um, trying to figure it out and then Mr. Beaver understands where Edmund went. And he also understands that his siblings want to go and try to save him. But then he tells them, you know what, this is not the way to do things. We, you shouldn't go that way. You need to run to Aslan's camp. And I think this is just a, a really profound picture. What Mr. what Mr. Reaver is essentially saying is, hey, don't run towards the witch's castle. Run towards Aslan's camp. R run away from this winter that's death and despair. Run, run to um, the coming of spring that's new life at Aslan's camp. It's a bit like, um, have you guys ever seen the Which Way Western Man <clears throat> meme? Have you guys ever seen that before? Here, if you haven't seen it, this is what it looks like. Okay, There's these diverging paths. One goes this way, the other one goes to death and despair. I'm technically a millennial. We do a lot of our deep thinking through memes, so that's why I'm including this here. <laughs> Blaze knows what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah, so, but you can kind of see that picture, right? Um, where Mr. Reaver is telling them, hey, run to the lion. This is your path forward. This is what you have to do. And thankfully, the children do heed that, and it works out for the good for them. 
The second way that Mr. Reaver um, exemplifies the prophetic is during dinner at their home. Uh, so he ends up talking to them about Aslan and how he's on the move, right? He gives them uh, the prophecies of spring, wrong will be right when Aslan comes in sight, if you remember that poem. He even gives them probably the most iconic and recognizable line from the Chronicles of Narnia that came from Mr. Beaver, is when they're asking him about Aslan, and he's like, who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. That's Mr. Beaver, right? And he's being prophetic by telling them about Aslan. Um, a prophet loves God's story, and it's very clear that Mr. Beaver loves God's story by telling the Pepinese about him. Moving on to, to priest. I would argue that this is Mr. Beaver's chief role in the narrative. He's a very important character, but this is probably his chief role in the narrative, is that he plays the priest. And what was a priest, and what is a priest? Um, a priest essentially is a, a mediator between God and man, right? We see that in the Old Testament with the Levitical priesthood. And of course, it's culminated with, uh, with Christ as our mediator between us and the Father, right? It's, um, th that's the, the role of a priest. And that's kind of a hard and fast, quick definition, but um, that's the nature of a priest. And Mr. Beaver, he does just that. He, um, his chief role in the narrative is to take the Pevensey children from where they are in, in the forest initially, a lost and homeless and stranded because of Mr. Thomas's arrest, and he leads them into Aslan's camp. Okay, he leads them into the presence of the lion. He, he, he serves that priestly role there. And it starts with him risking his neck, too. He puts himself in danger by going out into the forest where not all the trees are on Aslan's side, right? Some are, have gone over to the witch. And so it's a dangerous territory, but he still goes through with it because he knows what, what he's called to. Moving on to king. When talking about Mr. Reaver as king, it might be good to start with what God instructed the very first king to do. The, the very first king to do. In the opening chapters of scripture, God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply, be, be fruitful and multiply, sorry, and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. Now, maybe to address the elephant in the room before getting on to some of the other aspects of, of his uh, kingship, is that how did the beavers satisfy the creational mandate in that? How did they have children? Or how did they uh, meet that? The short answer is we don't really know. Um, we don't know if they had children. They, they might have. A friend quipped to me not too long ago saying, what if the beavers had children? And there's all these little joyful outposts just popped all over the, the forest. As cool as that would be, we just have no idea if they had children. But we do know what they did when they were given children. So one of the, the, the things I argue for in the book is that the beavers are the functional parents of the Pevensey children mm -hmm. in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Um, yeah, I, I think it's just, um, and th this is encouraging for, I mean, um, for, for all of us here, right? We can be that kind of, uh, we can play that kind of role for, uh, for, for, for people like that. Um, and moving on, secondly, as king, uh, Mr. Beaver knows and takes care of his kingdom. Like he, he really cares about the dam that he built. He really does. He, he gets kind of, kind of cranky sometimes. Um, and it's really exemplified by when, uh, by when Father Christmas comes to visit them and gives them all those gifts to, to the Pepsi children and then to the beavers. Uh, what Mr. Beaver got was uh, a repaired and fixed dam. And he was super stoked about that. So he cares a lot about his home. And he knows his home really well. Um, his, his domain. And then finally, the uh, last thing, th there's more we could harp on about his, uh, about his kingship, but lastly, a king is also a knight, a warrior. And Mr. Beaver, um, maybe the most obvious example is that he fought in the last battle, the Battle of Baruna against the White Witches for, uh, forces. Uh, he fought in that battle. Um, 
but not to mention all the other times that he put himself in harm's way to, um, to sacrifice and to you know, uh, potentially save uh, others in the story, like the Pevensey children. And so from this, like, you know, uh, there are some more examples I put in, in the book, but um, Mr. Reaver is a godly man who fulfills those offices in, in the right way. He images the lion in, in the right way in the narrative. I want to move on now to Mrs. Beaver. I'm going to first start by reading this slide. Women, or wives, uh, combat winter by joyfully submitting to their husbands by taking on their God-given role of being a helper. So I, I wanted to read that first because I think in our modern day, the, the, the type of what, type of way that we would read this would be in a negative way, right? Like, oh, okay, so the husband has to put the, the wife down a level or two to be the lowly helper, right? Um, that's just kind of how we, we, we read into things uh, nowadays, but honestly, it's just the, the, the wrong way to think about it. We're thinking about it upside down there. A godly husband raises his wife up to take on that role of, of being a helper. If the husband is the king, of his household. And of course, the wife is the queen. It's this high, important language given to, uh, to the woman, and it tracks with scripture too. In Ephesians 5, Paul calls wives the uh, co heirs uh, uh, with their husbands. In Proverbs 12, 4, it says a godly wife is the crown of her husband. So lots of this, this high importance, uh, this, this uh, dignified language to describe. The, the wife's role in the household. It's even uh, coming back to Lord of the Rings. Um, if we were to use that, uh, let's use that example. There's a couple, not in the movies, unfortunately. They should have been in the movies, but they weren't. But um, in, in the first book, there's this happy couple in this forest, uh, Tom Bombadil and uh, his wife, Goldberry. And they just kind of live on their own in this forest. They're a bit eccentric, but they're great. Um, and Tolkien actually uses the language uh, when describing Goldberry, the wife, is that she is enthroned in the home. So a husband, uh, a godly husband, enthrones his wife in the home. And I think that's, that's absolutely correct. And so the bottom line here is the modern notion of womanhood and feminism tends to look down on the woman described in Scripture, but it is incumbent upon godly men to hold the line and raise our wives up to take on the mantle they've been called to. In a letter to um, a Mrs. Ashton, um, here is what Lewis says about one of the, the primary callings of a wife, which is, which is homemaking. Here's what he says. I think I can understand that feeling about a housewife's work being like that of Sisyphus, who was a stone rolling gentleman. But it is surely, in reality, the most important work in the world. What do ships, railways, mines, cars, government, etc. exist for, except that people may be fed, warmed, and safe in their own homes? We wage war in order to have peace. We work in order to have leisure. We produce food in order to eat it. So your job is the one for which all others exist. Close quote. So your job is the one for which all others exist. Again, just this uh, important language to describe a, a wife's role as homemaker. I want to offer a few things Mrs. Beaver does in the story that showcases that type of mindset. First off, she knows her home really well. She really does. Uh, as exemplified when the Pevensies first come in, she's behind her sewing machine working on a line, and uh, so she has that down. Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, Lewis uses the language of it being kind of worn and used, so she uses it quite a bit. And like the sewing machine is I argue as a symbol of fruit, fruitfulness in the narrative, where just from this little bit of cloth that she has, she's able to turn it into something beautiful. Um, she also knows, um, you know, she, she, has, she has dinner ready um, on time, um, and even when it's time to pack up and leave for the stone table for Aslan's camp, um, she's, she knows where everything is. She's quick about packing for what they need, right? Um, she, she knows how to pack in a pinch. She also tries to pack her sewing machine, uh, the big bulky sewing machine, um, which she doesn't win that, that fight. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, she, she knows her home well. 
Um, also, she plays um, a, mother, a motherly role to the children, especially Susan and Lucy, the daughters. As the children come into their home, first off, you know, she's overjoyed to, to have them there. She's truly excited to have them in her home. Um, and then she whisks Susan and Lucy along with her uh, to go help with meal preparation. And I, it's, it's simple, um, it'd be easy to overlook it. I think it's a great picture of what an, an older godly woman should do. Um, it, it harkens back to uh, what Titus 2, um, 3 to 5 instructs about what uh, the older uh, woman in the faith should do for the younger woman in the faith, to, to take them alongside them and, and to teach them. Um, and then finally, uh, she practices great discernment and wisdom. Uh, to explain this one, it starts at Aslan's camp. So they get there, and, um, and then they, they save Edmund, but then the white witch comes to Aslan's camp and is coming to claim what is hers, she would say. W wants to claim Edmund. And it's just this, first off, it's just this big picture, right? It's, um, it's Aslan, it's the white witch, like this pay-per-view special, right? Um, this one time in the octagon, the white witch, the Aslan, and Aslan. Um, and it's just this big moment. But in an aside, uh, Lewis writes that Mrs. Beaver especially noticed, above everyone else, that the white witch could not meet the eye of Aslan. Like, why would, why would he put that in there? Um, I, I do, have, do have some theories. It kind of harkens back to uh, the night before at, at, their, at dinner in, 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 their, in their home when at, uh, Mr. Reaver essentially says, like, you know, if the White Witch could look Aslan in the face, that's all. that would be more than I could uh, expect from her. But um, what it showcases ultimately is that she has great discernment and wisdom, which is super important for, uh, for a wife to have, and especially Mr. Beaver's wife, because there are a couple of moments in, in the story where he gets a little hot-headed, um, and uh, she was able to kind of help, help reel him back a little bit. In fact, Mr. Beaver, in, in that same exchange with the White Witch and Aslan, he's, he actually tries to butt in and tries to, you know, argue with the witch too, and it's the only time in the story where Aslan growls at one of his own people. He's like, Mr. Beaver, this is not your fight, this is mine. Get, get out of here. Um, but, um, yeah, she, she has a great observation and discernment and wisdom. Uh, this is also exemplified when they're trying to, or when they're packing up to leave for Aslan's camp. And it's, you know, M Mrs. Beaver knows that, hey, we can't get there before her. We're going to be on, on foot. She's in her sledge. We're just not going to make it before uh, the White Witch. But we could go a different route to avoid her, to circumnavigate her. And so she spends a little more time packing a little bit more for him. And um, I, th I, thought that, I think it's just a, a, a bit of wisdom there, too. She understands what kind of fight they could, what, what kind of fight they could win. They, they couldn't do the obvious one. They had to do something different. But through it all, um, and I think this picture is just a great representation, too. Um, and when you read about her in the story, um, it's one thing that just exudes from, uh, from Mrs. Beaver is contentment. She's very content in what she's called to do. She understands her role. She understands who she needs to be for her family. And she does that without complaint. I just think that's a, just a great lesson for us because we live in an age of just deep discontentment. And honestly, I think it just, I think it hits harder at Daughters of Eve. Um, than, than anyone else, too. I think that, that, that really is the case. And so having an example like, like Mrs. Beaver is super important, that in the face of this, this winter that's freezing everything, there, there are godly women like Mrs. Beaver. I want to turn to, uh, to my, my last point here about biblical rest. I think this is a major theme in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So here it says, a household at rest is dangerous, and I'll explain that in a second. But it'd probably be good to, to talk about what rest is, what, what, what does it actually look like, because it's more than just leisure, it's more than just, you know, kicking back on the couch, um, watching a football game or whatnot. Th th there's more to it, and um, I'll, I'll keep it brief. It'll be another hard and fast definition, but, you know, rest, first off, is interwoven into the very fabric of the cosmos, of, uh, uh, of our world. 
as, you know, as God creates the heavens and the earth, the seventh day he rested, right? So it's built into the very nature of, uh, of creation. And, and it fast forwards in, into, into the Sabbath in the Old Testament and, and then culminates, of course, in, in Jesus. But the common denominator with rest is that it involves being in the presence of God, in, of communing with our Lord and Savior. And this is really important um, as the characters make their way to Aslan's camp because we start to see just how um, dangerous uh, rest is to the witch's winter, to this enemy-occupied territory. So, um, first off, you're, you see this group of Narnians right here. They have just been given gifts um, by Father Christmas. Chris, so Christmas has come again to Narnia, and they are enjoying those gifts right there. Uh, now, where are our main characters in this? Um, they are still traveling to the Aslan's camp, and when they're visited by Father Christmas, they get those um, iconic gifts. If you, can, if you can remember back to them, um, Lucy's cordial that heals, right, with her dagger. There's um, Peter's sword and shield. There's uh, Susan's bow and arrow and her horn. All those things are awesome. And of course, you know, Mr. Beaver's uh, fix and repair dam. And Mrs. Beaver, um, she gets a new sewing machine as well. So it kind of paid off for her that she left her sewing machine behind because she got a better one. Um, there's, there's a lesson there somewhere, right? Um, <laughs> but the gift I want to focus on comes after all those gifts. It's uh, what Father Christmas leaves the group with is a great big teapot. Um, and it might seem a little bit insignificant, but after Father Christmas leaves, they sit down and they have tea. And you can imagine if it's a great big teapot, it, tea time probably lasted quite a bit, right? Or, or quite a while. Um, so they're sitting down to tea. But, I mean, notice or take into account the, the story right now. They're trying to get to the, the camp before the White Witch. But here they are just kicking back, enjoying some tea, enjoying a cuppa, as the, the Brits would say. And I think that's really significant. And it plays into the idea of rest. Um, if we go over to, uh, to the White Witch, during this scene, she is absolutely furious. She is beside herself. Um, as the world is being restored, um, as spring is coming again, it is no coincidence that she is unable to rest. And it is no coincidence that as the snow melts, her deep unrest and fury floods to the surface. Um, I think that's very intentional. And when she sees this party, because she, stum she stumbles upon them, unfortunately these guys get turned to stone. Um, so they, they feel the witch's wrath. But um, what they're doing here enraged her so much. And the reality of spring coming again and her powers dwindling enrages her so much. And wh what these Narnians are doing here is that they're, they're resting. They're um, enjoying what the Lord, or what the lion is doing, his work over creation, restoring, putting things back to rights. As uh, the beavers and the Pevensies are enjoying tea time, they are resting and communing with um, the work of the lion. They are at rest here. And so, in this scene, rest is active. It's not passive. Rest, you could even say, is warfare against the powers of, uh, of winter. And that's why a household at rest is dangerous. Because when we're, we are actually communing with our Lord and Savior, when we are taking the time to disciple our children, to do family worship, to build up our, our wives as godly men, to, to serve our husbands as godly wives, that rest is dangerous. And it upends, it sabotages the, uh, the winter that has overtaken the land. And where I want to land the plane today is, is right here. So this is a picture of the Pevensies coming into the beaver's home. First off, look, look how little their home is. It's, it's crazy. Um, and yet they're, they, they're still like, we want to be hospitable, despite um, how small our, our location is. Anyways, um, there is glory in the ordinary. I want to end it off with that line, because I think it's just, it's so important. I think it describes um, 
think it describes the household quite well. Because so many of the things that we do around the home, they aren't flashy. They don't get recognition, right? My, my wife at, at the moment is probably getting the kids ready uh, to go to the birthday party. There's not a lot of recognition in putting a shirt on a two-year-old, right? But um, there is glory in the ordinary. There is eternal weight to the things that we do um, in our households. And coming back to the idea of the household's melody, you know, when we do these little things around the house, when we um, be godly men, we be godly women, um, and we sing in harmony with the lion, I, I, I do think that we see something similar that happened to the beavers where we, we started to see the coming of spring, um, where the wilderness that might be our home might look more like a garden over time. Just, over, just by these small, small actions. So when we strive to build up our homes, we are doing so much more than simply checking off an item on the to-do list. We are fortifying our outpost to sabotage this enemy-occupied territory that we live in. And so with that said, you know, may that song that we, that we should sing, may it ever be on our lips. Thank you. Totally, yeah. I'm curious what prompted you to select this particular, I mean, these are secondary characters, yeah. um, and, and, and they do serve a particular role that is unique in the books, but I was just wondering kind of what drew you, kind of what was the process by which you started thinking, that's really interesting, I'd really like to explore that, because that was the first thing that struck me, was like, wow, that's kind of a very specific little thing. Yeah, it's very niche, right? Um, so I've been reading Lewis for, for a very long time. Uh, I have a fondness for the Chronicles of Narnia, especially for, for a long time. And it's, as of late, in the past like few years or so, I've really been convicted about um, recapturing a godly household um, and, and, and being a, a godly husband. And so th those two things kind of merged. And it emerged when I was reading a book called uh, In the House of Tom Bombadil. It's by a pastor out in Washington, uh, Chris Wiley, or C.R. Wiley, his, his pen name is. And um, it's an excellent book. And he, uh, he engaged with the text, and from it he's kind of drawing similar principles, not the same, um, but similar principles from, from Lord of the Rings about, about the household and recapturing it. And I read it, I'm like, this is phenomenal. I love this. And I just started thinking, well, I mean, I know Narnia. Or, or, is there any example like that in Narnia as well? and I kind of stumbled upon the beavers. And so I actually started just writing a little bit about it, thinking this is going to be like a few blog posts I can throw on the, on the website or whatnot. But then I'm like, oh my goodness, there is so much here. This actually could be a, could be a book. And so that's where it came from.